Next coming to cingulate or subfalcine herniation. This is caused when one hemisphere swells and pushes the cingulate gyrus by the fat cerebri. This does not put as much as pressure on the brain stem as the other types of herniation, but it may interfere with the blood vessels in the frontal lobe that are close to the site of injury that is anterior cerebral artery. Patient may have abnormal posturing and further coma. Interference with the blood supply can cause dangerous rise in ICP that can lead to more dangerous forms of herniation. Though symptoms for cingulate herniation are not well defined, it may occur in addition to uncle herniation and may progress to central herniation. Next, coming to transcalvarial herniation, also known as external herniation. It is a type of herniation which may occur during hemicraniectomy, surgery in which flap of skull is removed, brain squeezes through the fracture or the surgical site, the protruding brain region prevents the piece of skull from being replaced during the surgery. Next, coming to upward herniation, increased pressure in the posterior fossa can cause the cerebellum to move up through the tentorial opening upwards. The midbrain is pushed through the tentorial notch upwards and the clinical features are similar as I told in uncle herniation and central herniation. Next, coming to tonsillar herniation, also called as downward cerebellar herniation, coning or transforaminal herniation. Cerebellar tonsil move downward through the foramen magnum. There is compression of the lower brainstem along with the upper cervical spinal cord. Patient may have intractable headache, head tilt and neck stiffness due to tonsillar impaction. Patient may have impaired sensorium and also gives rise to flaccid paralysis. Patient may have cardiovascular instability as well. Next, coming to the evaluation, the initial assessment begins with our primary survey that is ABCs wherein looking for airway, breathing and circulation. We have to ensure if the airway is patent. We have to assess for gag reflex. We have to monitor for respiratory depression or subnormal breathing patterns. We have to evaluate hemodynamic stability wherein looking for hypertension and bradycardia. A focused neurological examination in emergency room. Looking for level of consciousness using GCS scale. And we have to keep on monitoring for deterioration. Pupils, we have to look if it is unequal pupil which can be seen in uncle herniation. Bilateral fixed dilated pupil which is seen in central or tonsillar herniation. Pinpoint pupil may indicate pontine hemorrhage. We have to look for motor responses, assess for decorticate or deep cerebrate postures which suggest increased ICP and impending herniation. We have to evaluate for hemiparesis and hemiplegia. We have to do a cranial nerve examination wherein if the patient has abnormal eye movement or loss of doll's eye which indicates loss of brainstem reflex. Next coming to gaze deviation. Conjugate gaze towards vision indicates frontal eye field involvement. Loss of corneal reflex again indicates brainstem involvement. We have to look for Cushing's triad which is a late sign and indicates impending herniation. Next coming to neuro imaging wherein performing a non-contrast CT which plays a very important role from emergency room wherein we look for midline shift, effacement of ventricles or cisterns when looking for mass lesions like hematoma tumors or abscess wherein herniation signs in case of uncle herniation we have to look for medial temporal lobe which is displaced under the tentorium. So in central herniation there is downward shift of the diencephalon and brainstem. In subfalcine herniation the cingulate gyrus shifts under the facts and tonsillar herniation cerebellar tonsils enter into the foramen magnum. So this is a relevant radiological anatomy wherein this is a coronal uh, MR image, this is a sagittal view and this is an axial view. We have to know these important structures which we must be able to identify while looking for brain herniation. This is a normal anatomy. This is a cingulate gyrus, corpus callosum here, hippocampus. Just focus on the mark structure. This is a cingulate gyrus with corpus callosum here. This is the supracerebellar cistern, this above the cerebellum. This is the cisterna magna. This is quadrigeminal cistern. This is the midbrain pons and medulla. This is the pontine cistern. This is the medullary cistern. This is the interpeduncular cistern. Next, coming to this axial image. This is the uncus. This is the crural cistern. This is the interpeduncular cistern. This is the quadrigeminal cistern. This is the perimesencephalic cistern. This is the hippocampal gyrus. So, coming to few of the uh, images on her the first image here shows the subfalcine herniation. It is a CT image showing right subdural hematoma. This hematoma displaces the septum pellucidum towards the left side. The right lateral ventricle is compressed with left lateral ventricle being dilated. The second image here shows the descending transtentorial herniation wherein the left SDH leads to compression and rotation of the midbrain. As the midbrain is elongated here, there is complete obliteration of the perimesencephalic cistern. The third image here shows the 
ascending transcentorial herniation wherein there is obliteration of the quadriceminal cistern supracerebellar cistern interpeduncular cistern there is anterior displacement of the brain stem which is seen here next coming to icp monitoring it must be considered in comatose patient that is with gcs less than 8 with abnormal ct evd or intraparenchymal monitoring must be considered next coming to laboratory evaluation a routine cbc rft electrolyte must be performed coagulation profile must be performed blood glucose must be checked for or uh, arterial blood gas must be looked for PaCO2 and PaO2 blood culture and CSF must be done infection is suspected toxicological screen overdose is suspected next coming to lumbar puncture it is contraindicated if herniation is suspected performing lumbar puncture in a patient with raised icp can precipitate herniation perform only after imaging rules out mass effect and herniation risk next coming to neurocritical care involvement involve neurosurgery and neurocritical care team immediately prepare for potential craniotomy decompression or ventriculostomy next coming to monitoring frequent reevaluation of neurological status must be done every 15 minutes if patient is unstable we have to document trends in gcs pupillary changes and motor function continuous vital signs and oxygenation must be monitored next coming to emergency treatment coming to airway intubate if gcs is less than 8 or if compromised airway or respiratory drive short acting induction agents can be used like propofol or etomidate we have to avoid ketamine although recent studies says it is safe to use next coming to breathing while well maintaining a saturation level more than 94% avoid hyperoxia next coming to circulation avoid hypotension keep systolic blood pressure between 100 to 110 mm of mercury and a map more than 65 mm of mercury next coming to immediate measures to reduce icp first is head position elevate the head of the bed to 30 degrees maintain neutral neck alignment to promote venous drainage next coming to hyperosmolar therapies that is mannitol and hypotonic saline mannitol 20% in a dose of 0.5 to 1 g per kg iv bolus must be given over 10 to 15 minutes the onset of action is 15 to 30 minutes we have to monitor renal function tests and serum osmolality targeting less than 320 milli osmos per kg next coming to hypotonic saline using 3% saline in a dose of 250 to 500 ml iv can be given over 10 to 20 minutes with central line higher concentrations can be used we have to monitor a serum sodium targeting 145 to 155 avoiding rapid shift temporizing ventilation strategies we have to use short term hyperventilation targeting a pso2 of 30 to 35 mm of mercury in which effects are transient but risk of cerebral ischemia if used prolonged we have to avoid prophylactic use of hyperventilation next coming to sedation and analgesia basically it helps to reduce cerebral metabolic demand and control agitation use of short acting agents like propofol can be done but avoid if patient has hypotension fentanyl and midazolam can be used for pain and sedation next coming to seizure management seizure must be treated promptly consider prophylactic anti epileptic and traumatic brain injury avoid agents that cause hypotension or sedation delaying neuro examination next coming to glucocorticoids not recommended for traumatic brain injury or ischemic stroke may be used only in vasogenic edema from brain tumor next coming to definitive neurosurgical intervention emergency neurosurgical decompression wherein decompression craniectomy can be used for malignant cerebral edema ventriculostomy for hydrocephalus or csf diversion evacuation of hematoma abscess tumor is indicated next coming to identifying and treating underlying cause in case of hemorrhage we must consider anticoagulation reversal ischemic stroke consult neurosurgery for decompression hemicraniectomy if large mca infarct in case of infection initiate broad spectrum antibiotic if meningitis and encephalitis is suspected in case of mass or tumor consult neurosurgery for resection or debulking next coming to disposition from ed transfer to icu or neurosurgical unit for ongoing icp monitoring and management if ed lacks neurosurgical support urgent transfer to higher level center should be initiated next coming to prognosis prognosis is highly variable depending upon the type and severity of herniation time to intervention and underlying pathology so last coming to the conclusion brain herniation is a life threatening consequence of an elevated icp early recognition and aggressive management are key to improving outcomes understanding the types helps guide clinical suspicion and treatment